Chris, when you and I were in medical school and residency for that matter, um, it seemed abundantly clear that hepatitis C was going to overwhelm the liver transplant infrastructure within the United States. Today, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that hepatitis C is not going to overwhelm the liver transplant infrastructure of the United States. The bad news is that something else is going to do that, and that's NAFLD and NASH. Can you tell us the twin stories of these two things? And, and uh, yeah. how is it that, that, uh, that something that we believed could never be cured got cured? Yep. And then how is it that this thing that we didn't know existed 20 years ago is going to be, if it not already is, the leading indication for liver transplant yeah. in the developed world? It's such a kind of at once compelling but also humbling story. And I'll, in telling it, I'll add even a third actor that you know is is part of this as well. So um, hepatitis C, as as you alluded to, uh, you know, a viral illness, um, bloodborne illness that can um, is has kind of an interesting history. Some people that are exposed to to hepat so hepatitis C rarely causes an acute illness, fortunately. Some people that are exposed to it can clear the virus, so spontaneously clear the virus, but the majority are left with chronic viremia and subsequent uh, inflammation, which is, which is silent for years and in some cases decades. So the, the kind of history of this in the United States is that people were exposed to this, you know, in the 70s and 80s, either due to a time when the blood supply was not really tested for uh, as stringently and they acquired it through blood transfusion or they acquired it from use of IV drugs or other exposures, but then it went about their life and then here they are 20, 30 years later with cirrhosis and eventual complications of cirrhosis and, and indication for transplant. And, the, and for about 20 years, that was the predominant indication for transplant in the United States, which was a challenge because the medications we had to treat hepatitis C were not particularly effective, you know, response rates of 15 to 30% or so. So every one of those patients got recurrent hepatitis C after their transplant. And many went on to develop graft failure, you know, and cirrhosis essentially of their transplanted graft. So it was a, it was a particularly frustrating clinical problem because there was this enormous need but also we were only kind of partially solving the problem. Um, and you know what has happened and what you're alluding to is in the last 10 years essentially was the development of these uh, direct anti antiviral agents that have transformed the field of hepatitis C. And it, it's, you know, you can make some arguments about what's the greatest medical advance we've witnessed in our, you know, medical career, but that's up in the top two or three. Um, yeah, I don't. Know, I, I don't think I could think of something more impressive in my. I mean, adult maybe life. Maybe you could argue the the you know retroviral regimens that made HIV a chronic disease yeah, instead yeah. of a um, could could rival it. But but I mean, this is transformative. So you take patients who were on a certain path towards liver failure and death cure their viremia and what we what we actually anticipated would happen was that all the patients who already had cirrhosis would eventually go on to need transplant anyway but what we've seen is a precipitous drop in the number of patients mm. needing transplant for hepatitis C um, because once they clear the virus their liver does you know recompensate and repair somewhat and the patients that are not cirrhotic or with advanced fibrosis yet are never going to get there so it, it is a, it is truly a curative uh, situation so that drop has happened precipitously over the last you know three to five years it has been replaced you know nearly completely by actually two diseases um, the the first and the one that has this kind of incredible broad public health impact is is the is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or the concept of um, fatty deposition in the liver that leads to chronic inflammation and kind of just like a chronic virus you know ongoing inflammation fibrosis eventually cirrhosis um, and with the obesity epidemic and other associated diseases the prediction 
is that by 2030 or so, uh, it will become the leading indication for liver transplantation. Um, and we've already seen that curve start to inflect up pretty highly. The only thing that makes the story a little more interesting or frustrating is there's another curve that over the last several years has inflected even uh, mm. you know at a steeper slope and that is the the uh, incidence of alcohol related liver disease which is has always been you know a important cause of liver disease in the United States but unfortunately and you know whether you blame it on the economic downturn in the late 2000s or other factors, you know, really have seen an explosion of alcohol-related liver disease, made worse, by the way, by the pandemic. Um, and I think that has occurred at a time when transplant centers have adapted their approach to patients with alcohol-related liver disease to make it a, a little less of kind of this terrible Spanish Inquisition kind of approach to, you know, you're either in or out, you know, if, if we think you're committed to sobriety, to a system where we have developed resources, um, mental health professionals, counselors and such to support people in their sobriety, to allow them to get transplanted successfully. So, you know, I hope that that curve plateaus. Um, we unfortunately don't have an intervention for fatty liver disease that I see breaking that, you know, the slope of that curve uh, quickly. Um, and, you know, it has changed our field because, you know, the the population of patients with fatty liver disease is much different than the patient, the population with chronic liver disease of other causes, whether it's alcohol, hepatitis C. You know, most of those patients have liver disease and the consequences of liver disease, but usually, fortunately, not much in the way of other morbidity. Whereas you take the fatty liver disease patient population, they are, first of all, often obese, which you know poses surgical risk and other challenges. But on top of that, they have all the other manifestations of their metabolic syndrome. They have cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, et cetera, which poses you know, medical management challenges, both for making sure we select patients that are likely to be successful with transplant, but also with caring for them afterwards. I mean, the the, you'll hear the comments said that we're, we've kind of converted our liver transplant population to look a lot more like our kidney transplant population because they're dealing with these cardiovascular comorbidities and other things that are just, um, that are threatening their long-term survival as much as their liver disease and immunosuppression is. You know, I sort of think that the, the, the uptick in alcohol associated uh, liver disease or AFLD say, um, is kind of the parallel, but gets less attention than what we're seeing with the opiate crisis. So yeah, I think 100%. the the opiate crisis is, I, I think it's easy and understandable that you would throw the manufacturers under the bus. And in truth, they deserve to be thrown under the bus. Um, and you can throw the physicians under the bus who make, who prescribe them too freely. And that's fair as well. But the elephant in the room is the why right? Like, why is it that people are self-medicating with opiates that are made too freely available, et cetera? And I think with opiates, because the outcomes can be quite binary and stark in the nature of the overdose, the nature of the death, yep. it becomes very easy to focus on that. But acute alcohol toxicity is virtually unheard of. Very few people will drink themselves to death in a moment, right? Um, much more common, of course, is the chronic toxicity of alcohol. And I think that, you know, you're one of the few um, specialists within medicine as a transplant doc or a hepatologist who actually gets to see what that looks like. But I think it doesn't really register for most people that they're basically yeah. two, end, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think we unfortunately, um, it's it, that perception that they're different or the fact that we kind of both medically and society-wise treat them differently has prevented us from addressing the problem with the appropriate attention it needs. Um, you know, one of our hepatologists here at the University of Michigan, Jessica Mellinger, who's who's really dedicated her career to understanding alcohol-related liver disease, um, as she has refined kind of her approach to the evaluation and management of these diseases, you know, 
she really makes the sense that the the um, emphasizes the point that this is a behavioral disease. You know, uh, you could argue Nash can be a behavioral disease in some cases as well. But therefore, the resources have to be put forth to address the behavioral disease. Um, and I think you know we have kind of largely turned a blind eye at um, the impact of alcohol-related liver disease and alcohol use disorder in our society because of the just the factors you said. It's a it's a freely available you know um, substance. You know it's you don't have to go you know the the machinations and just kind of destruction that people have to go through their life to get opiates. That's that's not the case for alcohol. You can go to the Seven Eleven and get you know that the the kind of equivalently damaging dose you know there, and I think it's made the problem much harder to address. And I I am glad to see the transplant community and the medical community kind of re pivoting in our focus towards trying to help people address the 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 reasons you know why they're uh, involved in this cycle. Because uh, it is tragic, and one of the things that's most notable about the alcohol-related liver disease population now is they are ridiculously young. You know, so not only have they drank enough to destroy their liver, but they've drank enough to destroy their liver in their twenties wow. and thirties, and you know, which is a, which is a little different than kind of the kind of classic, you know, sixty-five-year-old guy who's been drinking all his life and you know gets to the end of his life and has that's right most of us think of the mickey mantle story where you know Correct. it's it's exactly what you described but no I, I think i think it it is the same disease and yet one uh one population numbs with an acute numbing agent opiates mm -hmm. that have an acute toxicity and the other numbs with a chronic numbing agent that has a chronic toxicity and yeah, to consider, to, to somehow put those into different silos um, yep. when I think the underlying conditions are similar is, is, is probably slowing our progress. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.